opening. So I'm opening this session, remote monitoring, digital health, data science, use of data. So we are starting early and we will finish up early. So we have 15 minutes for each speaker, including the Q&A. So my name is Halis Khan Akhtar from the Barbara Davis Center. So I would like to introduce the first speaker, Claire Petty from Children's Mercy Hospital. And the talk is effect of remote patient monitoring on subsequent three month hemoglobin A1C in youth and young adults with type 1 diabetes with suboptimal glycemic outcomes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Claire. I'm part of the Rising Tide Alliance at Children's Mercy. Um, today we're talking about remote patient monitoring um, with a three month follow up period in our population. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, so just a little bit about our patient population to give you guys some background. Um, we at Children's Mercy are situated on the state line between Kansas and Missouri. So we serve a pretty wide population all the way into Western Kansas, um, as well as Missouri. So we have 2,500 patients with type one. Um, we have an extensive staff that we're very grateful to have. We do not have 2,900 pediatric endocrinologists. That, that would be amazing, um, but we have 29. <laughs> which we're still very grateful for, but not that many. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a little bit of background on how we operate remote patient monitoring in our um, facility. As most of you are aware, it's a telehealth intervention. We operate usually on a three month basis, uh, starting at a standard of care visit that qualifies individuals with a baseline A1C. And we have multiple different referral sources that um, make our patients eligible for it. Uh, so a couple of other things, uh, we currently still offer our PM free of charge to our patients. Um, also for our purposes, we don't include any new onset individuals, um, and to qualify, you also have to have a minimum A1C of at least 7.2%. So we began running RPM in 2019, and we started with our two predictive models. Um, our data science team developed these two models, and we're extremely lucky to have them. One predicts a potential rise in A1C and another predicts a potential uh, DKA admission. Uh, the rise, what we refer to as the rise list, predicts a potential um, rise in A1C of 0.3% or greater within the coming 90 days. I mean, the DKA admission uh, list predicts one, uh, a potential admission within the coming six months. And these are all based off of A1Cs and clinic dates that are gathered um, the week prior usually. So we ran those for a period of time. And then after that, we realized that we were missing potentially some patients that could really be benefiting from this program. Um, the data that we were giving just not, wasn't necessarily pulling in the folks that we felt like could be benefiting the most from it. So we started using provider referrals. Um, and after that, we also, we kind of noticed the same thing still. And so we implemented what we call a high A1C list, which is kind of what we'll be talking about most today. It's individuals that have two A1Cs that are greater than or equal to 9% within the last 12 months. Um, this is something that I was pretty passionate about myself. I feel like we're all aware that, especially with the predictive models, it's causes the potential for individuals who aren't necessarily attending all of their standard of care visits to kind of fly under the radar and not get pulled into these things. Uh, so this kind of gives us a little bit more leeway to pull the individuals in that need a little bit more help that aren't necessarily getting to all those visits they may need to get to. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. So we conducted a retrospective analysis. Uh, we started using the high A1C list in 2020 and we took data all the way up to September of this year. Um, what we really wanted to look at with this in particular was, um, well, I guess I was very interested in looking at this because as I said, I felt very passionately about this population. Um, in anecdotally engaging with them, they felt really committed to their care and were very willing to be engaged um, and make adjustments to their care. And so we really wanted to look into see the efficacy of our RPM visits with these individuals just because they felt, um, I felt like it really was making a difference to them and making an impact and reaching out and engaging with them. They felt very grateful and willing to be involved in this. Um, and so we really wanted to look in and see what the effect was of it, was it? Um, so for inclusion, exclusion are in the beginning, we had a bit of a delay between um, contact and the qualifying A1C uh, just due to a capacity issue. Uh, so we had a few individuals that were disqualified because of that. Um, and we had to have an A1C at least 90 days after that qualifying A1C point. We were shooting for around a three month follow-up date. So around what would be a standard of care visit again? Um, 
you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, so this is a little bit background on our inclusion exclusion. Uh, we had 120 patients that were eligible over this period of time. Uh, the way that we pull them in is that our data science team on a weekly basis attempts to create these lists um, with all of the individuals that have had the two A1Cs greater than or equal to 9% within the last 12 months. I mean, so we pull approximately top five individuals from that on a weekly basis and put them into a list and attempt to make contact attempts with them. So we only were able to do about contact half of those individuals, which is relatively expected for that population. Um, as I said, so we ended up with about 63 individuals there and then had some individuals that we were lost due to lack of follow-up A1C at our clinic or others that, um, we're a little too recent for that. So we ended up with around 46 patients total in our final cohort. You can go ahead and move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we had 20 completers and 26 non-completers. To be a completer, we asked that they complete only one RPM visit. Our average is around three, I believe. Um, but we only required that one visit be fully completed. Um, and the intervention itself, just to give you a little background on that, um, is usually kind of determined between the family and the interventionist. Depending on the age, we allow uh, the patients to meet one-on-one -on -one with the interventionist if they're old enough, families can do it together, or just parents as well. Um, it's really kind of left up to the interventionist, the family, of how to optimize this time period. It's usually a 15 to 20 minute visit every other week, and um, we really kind of let them do whatever they can to do insulin adjustments, sick day management, whatever's going to help them optimize uh, their care. So we had 20 of those individuals that completed at least one, hopefully more than that. Um, the non completers we had 26, and those are comprised of individuals that either declined our intervention, um, were lost to follow-up after expressing interest, or did not attend their appointment. Um, for having such a small population, I felt uh, pretty strongly that we had a very good amount of diversity. Uh, and our statistics about technology being present at baseline, as well as their baseline A1C, was also pretty equal across the cohorts as well. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so for our results, for in, in our um, we saw an improvement in seventy five percent of those that completed, but only a thirty in thirty four percent of those that did not complete. Um, in individuals that did complete at least one appointment and saw an improvement, we saw one point one percent decrease in A one C in those individuals. Um, the median change for the entire group was a 0.9% decrease in those that completed, um, and the median change for those that did not complete um, was a 0.1% increase. Uh, so we were really happy with these results, very pleased with them, especially considering, as I said, we only required one RPM visit. Um, and I think that that held pretty true for the completers even. So it really just goes to show the efficacy of this intervention and its ability even with maybe one meeting to get them engaged and get them thinking about this um, can really be helpful to them and help us decrease their A1Cs, especially in such a short period of time as well. <laughs> um, so for our next steps, we're interested very much in doing this with a larger match cohort. Um, we're also actively looking into the dose effective visits, as I've mentioned multiple times, and we only asked for one, as I said, the average is three. Um, we really would like to figure out what number works best to give the most optimal results. That way we can um, give our interventions a little bit more capacity. And lastly, uh, as I mentioned, this is kind of a passion of mine, this population was. Uh, and as I said, it's obvious that they're a population that was very willing and very ready to engage. And it was extremely effective intervention, in my opinion, for this group of people. So for clinics or spaces that are interested in starting RPM, um, but don't have the wonderful resources that we do to have predictive models and data science teams, um, a high A1C list is a great way to get started that's not only provider referrals and can help catch some of those folks that are kind of flying under the radar in these situations. So I think that's all I've got. Thank you. Just a methodology question. Before you went to the high A1C list and you had your predictive models, were you just getting that from EPIC generated data or was that from CGM, was CGM data included in that? First off, unfortunately, we don't use EPIC at our clinic. <laughs> um, but I do have, I wasn't part of our team at that point, so I do have some of my colleagues here, Brittany, do you want to, do you know the answer to that question? Okay. Um, so before we started the high, our predictive models, our data science team started 
I don't know. Is even Mark in here? Okay. <laughs> Which data and demographic data. But no CGM. Yeah, we have we, we have expressly avoided CGM, although we have experimented with it. And the reason we've avoided CGM is that our uh, next goal is to disseminate this model to other centers in the T1D exchange. And so we try to create a parsimonious model that only uses data in the T1D exchange data spec for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, was there any in your intervention, any um, additional besides meeting, having at least one um, interaction with the interventionist? I'm just curious because um, is this something that could be implemented into the clinical care? What was different about that 15 to 20 minute meeting, meeting versus like what was done at a routine clinic visit that really made a difference in lowering A1C? Um. I really think that, well, I guess the difference in my opinion is, is that, you know, they're meeting one-on-one -on -one more and usually also in an environment they're comfortable with. So these are all telehealth visits. And so it's really at their leisure and their convenience. Um, and I think that's making those difference. And I think also just engaging with them, starting a conversation that's on us, that's saying, hey, we're interested in this. We want to help you being the ones to reach out, I think is also something that really encourages them to like participate and have an active role in it. Anything else? Yeah. Um, you said this was at no cost to the patient. So um, how how is it paid for? Is the the hospital system sort of invested in doing this, or who who covers the time for the interventionist and the data science team and all of that? That might also be a hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how how is this paid for? Oh, uh, so this is all uh, happening currently under a grant from the Homestead Charitable Trust, which is the Charitable Trust. And um, one of the things I want to emphasize is we have been for sustainability. So we have actually moved this beyond our grant funded team and into our clinical team. And we've used small tests of change. And um, some incentives, like we, we've actually incentivized some of our diabetes educators with after hours uh, pay for a limited period of time, just so that we can get more people on the non grant on the clinical team to get experience doing this. And the reason is we intend to like lean into these strategies with our PM wholly, and we're going to eventually want to shift our entire clinic model to incorporate this because we have to create the capacity. Um, and so we're examining you know, the very important question of what is it that you're doing that's less effective than optimal that you're going to de-implement right. to free up the capacity to implement something. Okay. Thank you. Are you billing for RPM? Are you getting paid for our patients? Like any day now. Okay. Any day now. So I think that's, I mean, that's all at the room because I think a lot of us want to pay for RPM. And then when patients get a bill, they're going to say, I don't have to do this. Yeah. So, so we have two strategies for that. One is that we plan to initially do this in uh, with new onset families. Yeah. So they've never experienced another way of showing. <laughs> another, another is that we intend to roll this out as a special program for students transitioning to college so that we can announce to families. And we have a different model of care from the college student which I think will make it more palatable, yeah. but you're absolutely right. Like we don't want to hit families with the new bill and we are having conversations with our institution about how to, you know, like not balance those accounts um, if it's not covered by insurance or it's underpaid by insurance. Uh, so we're, we're getting through that last step in the process, but we have all of our documentation, our consent, our orders, our multidisciplinary note, like everything is ready to roll. And we just have to figure out how to not let families get hit with a bill that insurance is public. So you're doing that section of the next morning session, right? We hope it does. I was going to comment also that um, so our institution is named Care Management Code. So all of our teams, like social work, nursing, RD, CD, like anytime they talk to a patient, like they're actually supposed to build those codes. And so that's how we're billing as opposed to RPM because our institution has actually interpreted RPM is something where you have to give a device to a patient right. on behalf of a 
healthcare system. So if it's a personal CDM, it doesn't count. So, um, but you can't double bill. So there's this yeah. question of like, what is what is the most robust way to do it? But because we have productivity metrics related to the care management code, that's what we. But that's essentially what's being used for the bump. And this is this is actually an important question. So your institution has interpreted that you have to give them a hardware device. Yeah. Our institution has interpreted that you have to give them a medical device and that software as medical device counts. Okay. And CMS is actually silent on this topic. Yeah. But that's where our lawyers won't go there. Yeah. Right? Because they have to go, but they won't like our our compliance people are like, no, you can't go that. We didn't go to them that device. Do we have time for? Oh. I was just, is that okay? So, well, it's kind of two questions. So, one, just the actual structure of the visit. So, was it kind of just, was there a specific structure? Is more just a check in, like to see how things were going? And then I think, I guess, a, a question for the back of the room is just a discussion with your institutions as people move towards quote unquote more value based. You know, if you show that these kids aren't being admitted and and are saving the hospital money on admissions. Obviously, it depends on the contracts and things you have. But if that's something that's been discussed long term, specifically because you mentioned, you know, kids at risk for DK, which once you've been admitted for DK, that's your biggest risk for future DK. Um, so just the visit itself, I'm curious, is it more just a check in? I think sometimes that's the benefit of our visits to kind of remind people that diabetes is important or if there were specific questions or things are more of just kind of free form talking with the family. Oh, yeah. Uh, to answer the first, it's definitely more of a check-in. That's kind of how we pose it to our families when we offer to them. We say these are kind of mini check-in visits, um, and you can use the time for the most part of how you like as they have, you know, devices. You go over device data, you make insulin adjustments, you do things like that, but it kind of is more free form um, and really determined between the interventionist and the family of what they feel like um, is most important to them to review in that period of time. And on, on, the second, on the first one, I'll just add, like, it's pretty much problem solving and checking in on goal attainment, right? That's, that's the structure. The, on the second question, um, the, uh, sorry, rephrase your question for me. Well, just as, as hospital systems move toward value-based contracts. Yeah, so, right? so, so what we're doing with that actually is we have our own accountable care organization at Children's Mercy. Now, in this particular project, our goal, our goal and our outcome was A1C, but we actually have another project where we're forecasting possible admissions for diabetic ketoacidosis. We have a very high-performing model. We can forecast within six months um, very accurately who's going to be admitted, and 60% of those individuals have never had admission after diagnosis in our cohort. So a lot of people have said, oh, I know who they are. No, we don't. Um, and, and in that case, We've actually, in the last three years of this project, reduced our hospital admissions for DKA in half. And our value-based care organization is working on a contract with us right now to continue to sustain that particular aspect of this program where we're delivering RPM to individuals predicting the hospital. Okay, we'll go to the next session, please. So, sorry, actually, you have to sure. So our next speaker is the Dan DeSalvo from Texas Children's Hospital. We'll be talking on leveraging EMR data to enable remote patient monitoring in the Rocket Time Fund program. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. I'm honored to present on behalf of my colleagues, which consists of pediatric endocrinologists, psychologists, epic builders, QI support folks, a really dynamic multidisciplinary team. Oh, I, you'll have to advance for me. Thank you. So these are my disclosures. And a little bit about Rocket T1D. So this all was initiated with actually a Helmsley RFA for uh, diabetes care innovation. And we proposed this initiative to dynamically shift the paradigm from reactive to proactive care, supporting patients not just at their touch points with clinical encounters, but dynamically between clinic visits as well. And hence, we're really leaning into the Houston NASA space theme here with Rocket T1D, remote outreach and care for kids empowerment and technology use in type 1 diabetes. And there are two phases of this program. There's an initial launch phase, Khan, if you can advance a couple, there we go, um, with an overarching goal to, to really empower youth and their families to leverage emerging technology, improve diabetes self-management habits, and achieve their self-care goals to thrive on their T1D journey. So there are three main components to this intervention, which include remote patient monitoring, 
And the main focus for today, we'll be talking about the EMR-based tools, which is Epic is a system that we use to support this. Um, predictive analytics with our uh, risk index for poor glycemic control and risk index for DKA, which have been validated and are available in our EMR to support the care that we provide for these kids at risk for, for these outcomes. And then timely interventions that are tailored, targeted, and triaged to families and patients when they need them most. So here are the, the two phases of Rocket T1D, the target population. We actually, for all patients with newly diagnosed diabetes, are part of this launch phase as their first three, three months of their journey. And then for established patients with a moderate to high RIDKA score, I'll unpack that a little bit on the next slide. Um, those who are starting a new technology or those with a recent DKA admission can be part of a launch phase as well. And what the launch phase consists of is very frequent touch points that are really focused on supporting diabetes self-management habits. Shout out to Joyce Lee over here with her six habits of, of diabetes management, um, which are a, a chief focus of supporting these families. Also frequent ther therapy adjustments. For new onset families, we're starting every child on a CGM within the first two days of diagnosis. They are then supported by remote educators for the first three months with frequent touch points, education and therapy adjustments. And at two weeks, they have a they have a telemedicine visit with the goal of initiating AID, automated insulin delivery systems, early in their journey. Um, and because there's some, um, you know, some concern about what does that look like in partial remission and honeymoon when they have lower insulin needs, we then move them on to an orbit phase where the RPM team is following them at least monthly, looking in through Gluco with the integrated CGM and insulin data to make therapy adjustments when needed in between their clinic visits based on their, their glycemic outcomes. And um, this is, a, 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 again, a dynamic team of, of many people across different walks of the clinical life, educators, psychologists, um, workers. Uh, one of our fellows, Guido, is actually presenting right now at the same time. So if you have a chance after this, he's in. I, I don't know which room, but he's, he's presenting um, shortly after this. And each week we have mission control meetings where we talk about the patients who are in the launch phase, in the orbit phase, review their data from a dashboard in EPIC, and talk about the educational needs and therapy adjustments. Go ahead. So here is that risk index for DKA. It was actually created over the last 10 years with some iterative improvements over time. And again, we use Epic. So this is that storyboard on the left. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but that RIDKA score is shown front and center, where each time you log into the chart, you can see that RIDKA score displayed in Epic. And the way that it works is it's incorporating three main measures currently, which include their most recent A1C, whether or not they've had DKA events in the last two years, and um, if they have Medicaid or if they're underinsured or uninsured. So this is a dynamic measure that changes over time. And you can actually, within Epic, simulate if there's a change in A1C, a change in insurance, um, and so on, what, how their IIDKA score will change. And then based off of this, our team of social workers, community health workers, educators, et cetera, can understand who these patients at higher risk are when they're providing this remote patient monitoring or point of care um, encounters with, with patients. Next. So again, shout out to Joyce and her team right here with Ashley and Justine who's a designer. We partnered with them to develop um, a, a flight manual for patients where we really go over each of these six habits focusing on glucose monitoring, insulin delivery, pre-mill bolusing, um, therapy adjustments, reviewing data. And this is part of that first three-month journey of people with type 1 diabetes to set them on the right path, as well as establish patients who are new to technology or just need a little bit of help in their care at that point in time. So get kind of leaning into some of our EMR tools here, we have this parent registry um, that we started about a decade ago where we can really identify who has type 1 diabetes, who has other types of diabetes. And then based off of that, we have child registries where we can identify folks in need of different types of care. And with Rocket T1D, we're able to um, you know, identify who are the patients who are in the launch phase, move them on the orbit phase. And then our team where they live and work in Epic can access their, their, their data from there and I'll show up what that looks like on a, uh, on a future slide with that dashboard. On the left, just briefly what I'll show is at a population health level, we can see with different PDSA cycles or smart aims with, with QI, 
at a glance, how are we doing with our team or even for our specific patients, whether it's something like, you know, screening for thyroid or, um, you know, the, the, the percent of patients on, on pump or AID and so on. So that's all right here on this dashboard. Next slide. So this is a flow sheet. I mean, flow sheets are oftentimes a, a nice mechanism, one for um, capturing discrete data elements that you could track over time, two for streamlining documentation, and then three for tracking progress. So this is the Rocket T1D flow sheet, and this is the mechanism to place patients in the launch phase, the orbit phase, to graduate them from the program, which thereby enables our, our RPM team to monitor their progress over time and access their data. And in terms of accessing data, this is what the dashboard looks like. And um, what you can see on top is several different discrete variables, variables of clinical interest, like are they using pump, CGM, what's their most recent A1C, when, when was the last DK event, when is their next diabetes clinic visit. Also, social drivers of health markers, such as we use a five-tool a, a five screener for housing, transportation, financial resources, medical literacy, um, food insecurity. You can see all that at a, at a glance here and then open their chart to, um, you know, to document, to um, see how things are going and so on. And then again, we use the Rocket T1D flow sheet, not just for placing patients into various stages of the RPM program, but to track their progress. And specifically here, um, and we developed this in partnership with, with Joyce and her team in Michigan, we can query the patients on how they're doing with each of these six habits. And when you answer the question on the flow sheet, if they're not yet achieving the habit, it will show up in red. And if they're achieving the habit, for example, they're using CGM over 70% of the time, it will show up in black, both for the care provider, but also the documentation. Uh, so we have a, a, a mental model of how patients are doing on each of these six habits and can lean into the education to close those gaps where they exist. And we're also using Gluco's population health tracker. And the goal of Gluco, as opposed to using like LibreView or Clarity, is we really want to have that integrated CGM and insulin data since our one of our chief measures is to try to really support AID system use. And so with Gluco's population health tracker, we can flag our patients to put them into the orbit phase or rocket phase or, or launch phase and be able to go on, onto this dashboard and access their data with a click of a button. And um, the EMR integration allows the smart data elements in the flow sheet. So you can, act, you can assess, for example, what is time in range, how many boluses per day, time below range, et cetera, um, from the EMR. And there's also a one click from the EMR into Gluco, which goes straight into the patient's Gluco report directly. So what is the impact? You know, I hope that I can report back to you on a lot of our different measures. Um, so far, we're seeing increase in the desired direction for things like CGM, pump, AID system use, et cetera. But what I'm really excited about, and we as a team are um, you know, thrilled with, is that for the first time in the life of our clinic, since we've been tracking data, if you look at the blue line, that's the percent of people with an A1C that it's above 9.5%. And the black line is the percent of patients with an A1C below seven. And for the first time ever, these two lines are kissing. So we have as many patients, actually slightly more with an A1C below seven than above 9.5, and our hope and desire and aim is that we'll continue to diverge with all of the systems and practices and technology that we're, we're leveraging and supporting families on their journey with. So in closing, I just wanna say a word of thanks and gratitude to the Helmsley Charitable Trust for um, helping us ignite this really important work. And we wanna share this with all of you and would be happy to share our Epic tools that we've used as, as um, you know, the lessons learned. Um, and I wanna thank our amazing clinical team for the work that they do on a daily basis. Kelly Timmons is our Epic IT analyst, and we've been able to free up some of her time, and she is a miracle worker. Somebody asked yesterday about how long it took to build a dashboard. Because of the, 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 the labor of love that's gone into this with developing the registry, it takes a matter of like days to weeks to, to develop something like this. Um, and then Don Buckingham, uh, we, we've really um, leveraged as a support person with the QI to really frame this with QI tools, methodologies, and, and tracking our outcomes. And you know, this is at the end of the day for the youth with diabetes and their families who we serve, and it's a privilege to be on that journey with them. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Hold this, hold this. And your, your risk index, the RIPKA, I know that you guys have developed the 
like we have people on Zoom, so I guess they can hear me now, right? So you, you guys have that risk, the RI DKA. I know that at Baylor, you guys had published the RI PGC, if I'm saying those letters right. Is that similar? Is that an updated version or is that something different? Like what goes into the metrics? So the, the, the question is about a couple of the metrics that we use for predictive analytics. The RI PGC score is risk index for poor glycemic control. And that is based off of a manual um, interview that the social worker does with the family at the point of diagnosis. So that early on, based on some of these social drivers of health, um, these can actually feed into the model to help us understand who's at risk for poor glycemic control and or DKA and the months and years ahead. Whereas the RIDKA score, risk index for DKA, is all based off of data and, and EPIC that's automated. Namely, the, the, the presence of DKA in the last two years, the most recent A1C, and the insurance status. That's published uh, in clinical diabetes. from uh, D David Schwartz is the author uh, from 2021 or 2022. Um, and the PGC score, actually, the, the genesis of that was, uh, was about a decade ago. And uh, the, the other thing that I'll add is, as part of this, um, a little bit outside of the scope of today's talk, but what, we, what we're also doing in parallel to this is trying to augment this RIDKA score with other variables in EPIC. And what we found, as an example, is that the presence of food insecurity carries an increased risk of severe T DKA, pH less than 7 or bicarb less than 5, or having multiple DKA events in a year. And because we're screening for food insecurity at every visit, we have um, robust data on that. Um, as, we're, as we're building out our data on the other domains of social drivers of health, i.e. transportation, health literacy, financial resource strain, housing, uh, we will be able to, to, to query the model on whether those are independent predictors of, of DKA or poor glycemic control as well. Dave, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand the, the mic. Good stuff. Um, obviously, CGM integration into EMR is a hot topic. It came up yesterday. Could you just kind of restate like what metrics are available in the EMR and how big of a task was it to get that working with you know Gluco and how you do that? So um, the question is about, you know, there's been a lot of work on CGM integration with EMR, but how about that next step of incorporating the integrated insulin data as well? Um, and so, you know, for us, it's been it's been a long journey, and for us, we're using Gluco for that. Um, I will say that everything has gone pretty smoothly up until the um, sort of IT security aspect of everything and requiring single sign-on for security purposes for that entry into Epic. And the Gluco team has been really, they've been really helpful and hands-on with our IT builders and kind of providing that roadmap and blueprint to, to help to, to enable it. Um, but I feel like we could have a panel on this alone. And I will point to the um, Juan Espinoza and David Klonoff and the acronyms escaping me, but they've already created a nice roadmap. ICODE, yes, ICODE for CGM integration in the EMR. And with their ICODE 2, it's a focus on AID, insulin, insulin delivery. So um, just briefly, some of the aspects of that is obviously your glycemic uh, outcome of interest, but also insulin data. So number of boluses per day, percent basal versus bolus, total daily dose, um, you know the 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 type of of insulin delivery system and so on. This discreetly available, so you can imagine a day with the T1D exchange. If we could share that data, we could look at outcomes beyond A1C and base it based off of type of system and um, you know, the the outcomes of interest with that. Yes, um, I have your population health tools are fabulous and amazing. So great job. Um, I would love to talk to Kelly Timmons and pick her brain um, immensely. Um, my question is like logistics um, as a nurse manager, like facilitating this with the team and what that looks like. And then my second question is um, with your discrete data, are you, is it based off that flow sheet and it's flowing into your dashboard or do you have discrete data elements embedded in Epic to pull to the dashboard? To answer the second question first, it's actually both. So discrete data, I mean, there are discrete data elements all over Epic. So whatever those key metrics of interest are, we built out our registry over the last several years to enable those to flow into our, you know, th those dashboards as, as an example. We, 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 we use, a, we use a, 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 a small flow sheet that has about five or six items 
that really anchors who the, who the patients are, what their chief therapy is, and a couple of other things that, 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 you know, are variables that we want to be able to follow, but everything else is a cascade with an Epic. So, you know, things like, uh, screening for whether it's screening or next clinic visit, or those, those are all things that are, that, that reside with an Epic and we just automatically, they can pull into the dashboard. So it's, you know, it's the, the flow sheet is a mechanism for capturing things that aren't available as a discrete data element, but most of it is automated. And to answer your first question, um, uh, just in terms of managing that clinical team, um, we have really developed a model where a lot of them work remotely. And so having um, a regular cadence of meetings to align the team is important. Uh, but a lot of the care that they provide is is by nature remote. So it's sort of a, a surround sound multimodal uh, model of telephone calls, telemedicine, um, of dynamic support with those patients and families, including having a cell phone and or, and or using um, some e a mechanism that's very patient and family friendly for um, connecting with the team. Yes. I mean, I'll ask, ask the tough questions. Um, my first question is about the the DKA, RI, DKA index, and you mentioned it pulls in the re most recent hemoglobin A1C. Um, are you seeing patterns where you have patients, because if they're doing more telemedicine, most recent A1C is what, an A1C six months ago, three months ago, and so how does that, like how far is the look back? How does that factor into it? And then the second question was, I think since you're including patients who are new onset as well as moderate DKA, so when we're seeing a trend with the, improvement in patients, like higher number of patients with lower A1Cs, how much of that do you think is impacted by them being in the partial remission phase? Being in the what? In oh, okay. Yeah. So um, the first question is, is around A1C. You're right. I mean, the, the model, the model is only good as the data in. So in this new era of uh, multimodal care delivery with, with virtual and in-person touch points, the, it's the most recent A1C and it looks back to a year. So as long as I've had A1C in the last year, so that score won't change until one of those variables, i.e. A1C um, insurance or, or a DK event. Um, it would be ideal to have um, auto automatically integrated CGM data where you could look at GMI or time and range or other variables. And so that's sort of a, a next phase in, in, in terms of the, developing that model. Um, to Mark's point, we want this to be something that can be transported to other centers as well. So. Um, we're at various levels of maturity and, and having that integration. Um, and to your second question around, um, you're asking about partial remission affecting A1C. The, the improvement A1Cs. So the graph that I showed was actually looking at a population health. And that specific graph was patients who were at least six months out in their T1D journey. So that was looking at patients who've had six, at least six months. That was for 3,000 patients with type 1 diabetes where we see more patients with A1C below seven than above 9.5. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. Thank you guys all so much. So our next speaker is Donna Eng from the Helen DeVos Children's Hospital. The topic is the design of the electronic health record in type 1 diabetes centers. Um, so we can leverage our electronic health record to do amazing things like remote monitoring of our patients and it informs our quality improvement projects. We've talked a lot about the really great things that we can do with that data, but um, we wanted to look at how is that data being collected? Um, and so we sort of viewed this as, oh, here are some of our disclosures. Um, and we wanted to look at the current state of affairs on how are we getting that data into the EHR across the collaborative. So things like labs and demographics and medications can be captured in a structured manner across EHRs, but what about our diabetes device data like time and range? Who's on a pump? Who's not on a pump? Who's on an automated insulin delivery system? who are those self-management metrics, like the number of boluses that they're giving, and um, are they um, adjusting insulin between visits, looking at their data between visits. Um, so we can all agree that design is important. And um, so we wanted to describe about what EHR tools are being used and what are the cl clinic workflows to get that data into the EHR and how does that impact the number of core data elements that are subsequently available at each site. 
Um, so Joyce Lee and I interviewed 13 centers across the exchange. Um, we asked that the centers provide screenshots of their EHR tools um, and clinic workflow, uh, clinic workflows. And then those centers um, shared those screenshots. Um, and um, then we looked at how many core data elements were available. Um, there were 12 pediatric centers and one adult center. Um, all the centers utilized a structured data tool, meaning they had flow sheets or electronic forms that collected discrete data elements as opposed to say, um, reviewing a note or doing a chart review and collecting data in that way. Um, 10 centers used EPIC and three centers used Cerner. Um, the available metrics that were available from each center were anywhere from four to 17 at each site. Uh, the metrics that we looked at were glycemic outcomes like time and range, time and low range, patient reported outcomes like depression screening, um, SDOH and diabetes distress, and self-management metrics like CGM use, pump use, um, bolusing three times a day, who's on an um, automated insulin delivery device, um, timing of insulin bolus, reviewing data between visits and adjusting insulin between visits. Um, we also looked at the documented transition plan, as well as diabetes um, diagnosis and diabetes type. So most of the centers had information about glycemic outcomes and diabetes technology use. Um, fewer of the centers had um, information about self-management behaviors, again, who was um, reviewing insulin between, dose, between visits and um, the number of boluses per day. Um, there were eight that had an EHR field um, specifically to capture a diabetes type, um, seven captured a diagnosis date, and the remaining centers did a combination of ICD-10 codes in the problem list, billing codes, um, or medical history. Um, this is just to demonstrate the wide variability in the questions that were used for the structured data elements. Um, so for just this is just an example of you know CGM use. So when we ask about CGM use, each of these boxes represents a different center and how they had asked that particular question. Um, so some of the centers were asking, are you wearing a CGM, yes or no? And so that counted as, okay, they use it, that patient uses CGM. Others captured the brand. Um, some only counted CGM use if they had worn it in the last 14 days. Um, and so this top, uh, like sort of section A, sorry, it's hard to see, um, shows the number of centers with a particular EHR tool. So again, all had a structured data tool, such as flow sheets or electronic forms. Nine had questionnaires that were filled out by the patient, whether that be a, a paper questionnaire or um, getting questions via tablet. Um, three of um, the centers were able to bring those questionnaire elements directly into a structured data form that was then reviewed by a, um, a MD or an APP at the visit, um, as opposed to having someone fill it out, for example, like on paper, and then um, input it into their um, structured data tool. And then two had um, automated integration measures of a diabetes device um, directly into the EHR. Um, section B shows the data elements that were captured by each EHR tool. So structured data um, tools captured glycemic outcomes, self-management tricks, transition plan and depression. Questionnaires had a um, tendency to, again, do more of those patient-reported outcomes like self-management skills um, and depression screening. And then in the last section, you can see all the various stakeholders um, that participated in getting that data into um, discrete data elements. So in most centers, it was the um, MD or APP um, and or a, a CDE that were most commonly responsible for entering that data. Um, again, patient responses were sometimes were able to directly flow into that structured data element. And then MAs were largely involved in inputting, say, depression screening and um, SDOH screening. Um, this is a center level table showing the number of encounter um, level data elements. So the EHR, the EHR tool that's available at that site, um, who's inputting that data, 
Um, and so there were two, again, two main types of clinic flows. Eight of the centers had a paired clinic flow where it was a CDE with an MDA and APP that would see the patient at every visit. Um, and then five of the centers had a provider only workflow. It was only the MD or APP that saw each person, um, each patient at every visit. Um, and then CDs would sort of come in as an as needed basis. Um, it was those with a paired workflow that generally had a higher number of data elements available as opposed to a um, provider only workflow that tended to have fewer data elements that were available. So essentially like if there was a paired model that spread the burden of entering that data into an element, um, they were more likely to have that data element filled out as opposed to if there was um, a provider only that were less reliably able to enter that data each visit. Um, the last center, center M, um, demonstrates that just because you have a structured data element doesn't mean that there's always available data. So, um, so again, 12 of the centers captured the data every visit, but at Center M, only the CDEs were in inputting that data, and they weren't seeing patients at regular intervals. Um, and so much of that data was missing um, in their patient population. Um, so, you know, the use of our tools and our metric definitions and workflow design is highly variable um, and lacks standardization um, and that can have an impact on our data availability. The ability of a center to report on a metric depends highly on the type of question that was asked, the frequency with which it was asked and the consistency in which the team captured that data. So maybe our next steps could be if there could be like a pre pill package that could be shared across the centers, especially as you know new centers come on, that would create a universal electronic form that would standardize not only the glycemic outcome metrics like time and range, um, but also self-management metrics like how often are they bolusing and are they adjusting um, you know, their doses between visits. Um, you know, we admittedly had a convenient sample of senders with um, within the exchange, so um, who uh, who we included in the sort of the study was basically who would talk to us, um, and so that probably skewed towards more that had a health IT capacity. Um, we didn't do video capture of the clinic workflow, um, and instead, you know, relied on narrative of how. Um, clinic uh, worked. And then um, we didn't evaluate the quality of the data, but focused really more on just the availability of the data amongst the different centers. So any questions? Thanks so much for that. And this is really impressive work kind of summarizing the landscape. Clearly a lot of variability um, across centers and the way that we're capturing this information. Do you know if Epic, like Verona Epic, is working on creating a standardized tool that, you know, as as more and more sites come do this work, there's going to be like a hundred iterations of this <laughs> this form. Um, and it seems like we we need to get ahead of this and get this done at um, at the, the very high levels of EHR, Cerner, and Epic, and maybe come up with some sort of consensus statement on on exactly how these questions should be worded and what should be included. I think Joyce might be able to speak more to, you know, sort of what's happening specifically at Cerner or, Cern or Epic and again, putting together that pre-package that would be able to be able to easily be implemented at, you know, a site that would have minimal site specific IT involvement. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to acknowledge that there are these Epic work groups that some of us have participated on. I wouldn't say that they've like disseminated far. I think part of the issue is that it included adult adult participants. I don't know, Priya, maybe you can give more detail, but like to my knowledge, that really hasn't been disseminated across the board. Um, and they weren't necessarily specific to some of the key, key self-management metrics that I think we need as type one focused diabetologists. So I think that was one of the limitations. 
So um, Epic did put out a PEED specific um, smart form about a year or two ago. So you can have your IT administrators look for it. Um, it does have some measures. It's a fairly detailed form. So you may not want all of all of it, but there are things like bolusing that you can document. Um, and I'm trying to remember some of the other metrics that were on there. I don't know if now now you remember, but <laughs> Um, but it's out there and you can implement it. Um, we had spoken to Epic several years ago about trying to make a common smart form or flow sheet so that it would make data mapping easier. Um, they weren't very interested back then, but I wonder if we, we can reapproach them now if um, if they'd be open to working with us. So I have a colleague who's in neurology and there's a group of individuals who've worked on an epilepsy form. And essentially what happened is there's a, there's a mechanism, at least an epic nun, Cerner, sorry, Mark, <laughs> um, whereby, <laughs> whereby she had a colleague at Cornell who developed it. It has, it's a smart form with smart data elements. And then essentially when we wanted to install it at Michigan, it was like at the next upgrade, you just add it because it's already sanctioned by them. And then it's turnkey, right? So you don't need extra IT analyst support. You don't need a lot of customization. I think the biggest barrier, so I think we should move towards that, but I think the biggest barrier, if you looked at that slide that Donna showed, use a CGM, has a CGM, use a CGM for seven days, has a CGM for 14 days. Like we need to come together and come up with some standards. And the problem is that everyone like loves their form, right? right? everyone loves their form. So like they don't want to change their form or their workflow because they like those data elements, right? So I do think we need to come up with some sort of like parsimonious set of measures. We have to agree that they're not perfect and they don't capture every aspect that we all want, but we have to decide that there is a standard as part of this group and we have to pursue it. Just like in the way that the ICGM project, right? There's going to be standards. There's issues with individualization, but we have to move towards agreement. And I think that's where we've like been, yeah. Why wouldn't we start with the No, I think we should. Well, and that's what we did. Cause we looked at the 14 data elements we, or the 17, we started with like the basic spec. That was our purpose, right? But, but the use of CGM, like we need to come to a room and we need to decide what that means. <laughs> People who use pumps kind of use pumps, right? Yeah. People who don't, don't. But CGM, it's like very wishy-washy. My supplies didn't arrive. Like I've been exposed to a CGM. I wore it three months ago. <laughs> my supply stopped arriving at my doorstep yeah. because my third party supplier sucks. Right, 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 right. 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 No, and I mean, I think, I think we just, yeah. So we have these definitions, but we're not even aligned on exactly what we think these definitions are as we put them into the spec. So I think we started the spec and we really, really nail it down. And then like, I don't know how my colleagues are entering this in my own institution. I've told them yeah. what I think CGM use is, but it's kind of willy nilly. But the other thing I want to mention is for Epic, you know, I don't know if some of you guys are on Cosmos, but essentially it's like a slicer dicer, but like on steroids, because it has like 120 centers across the entire country. So it's all mapped with smart forms and smart data elements. So if we can get standardization, we actually could look at meaningful incomes across, like outcomes across 120 institutions as opposed to, you know, yep. where we are right now. And AID use is really hard to track. Is it, is it, do you have a hardware? Is it percentage use? Yeah. Like I know I was talking to Kelly about this this week and that's, that's a, a gap in our data spec that really deserves a lot of attention in science that, you know, the, the folks wanting to do the science with it or struggling because we're not entering that well because we're not all the same. Yeah. Help us, Joyce. Server can do those things. I think that would be a really good thing for us to do in the next yeah, yeah. year is really nail down maybe yeah. three definitions yeah. other yeah. Yeah. CGM, AID. Uh, that's like really join focused. the data science committee. Yeah. We'll get it done. <laughs> but I think really nail it out. Okay. So our last speaker is Amanda Perkins from the Children's National and is talking about the developing a tracking tool for CGM prescriptions among children and young adults with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, 
So we all know that rates of CGM use uh, remain suboptimal and that this is a powerful tool to help improve glycemic outcomes and also that disparities exist. Um, I think we can all agree on that. Um, but also that successful CGM uptake requires input from a multidisciplinary team, including the prescriber, a pharmacist, admin team, and educators. And um, so our team, in an effort to increase uptake of CGM in our clinic, um, I created a fishbone diagram in which we identified the inability to track CGM prescriptions from initiation to fulfillment and education as a barrier to uptake. And our change idea was that the ability to better track this pro process would be a way to increase uptake. Next slide. So I started as a, from my sort of prescriber perspective by creating a process map. Um, which is was pretty straightforward. You know, I identify a candidate for CGM. I discuss it with a patient. The patient agrees to start. I send a message to our diabetes refill, refill pool, which is the team that works on um, prescriptions for our patients with diabetes. Um, then the patient receives their supplies. The CGM class is scheduled. The patient gets educated um, and they start their CGM and then they get their refills and are able to stay on CGM six months and beyond. Um, so I took this process map to our multidisciplinary team and in discussing with them, it was clear that a whole lot was going on in between the time that I sent that message to the refill pool and the time that the patient started CGM. Lots of people are, were involved in this process. There are lots of different steps and they're all being documented in different places in the chart. So um, it was clear that this process map was not going to be sufficient. And we went back to the drawing board and ended up creating two separate process maps work in collaboration with the multidisciplinary team. Um, if you can click two more times. One is was for patients using DME. And then we have a separate process map for patients with pharmacy benefit. And I mean, I definitely don't mean for you to be able to see all the steps, but only just to um, emphasize the difference in kind of like how I thought it was going and then in collaboration with everyone else, what actually was going on sort of behind the scenes. And also to emphasize that the process is not at all linear. And I think it also looking at these two maps highlights the um, multiple opportunities for patients to get lost to follow up and things to get lost in the process. Um, I'll just pause here and mention that you see Dexcom and CGM used a little bit interchangeably in this process map. And that's because we do primarily use Dexcom in our clinic because there's widespread insurance coverage and also um, because it's compatible with AID systems, starting patients on Dexcom at or close to diagnosis helps make that transition more seamless for our patients. Next slide. Um, so <clears throat> with that process map in mind, we went to our IT team and developed the CGM power form and our, um, our EMR is Cerner. So um, the C CGM power form has four tabs, general education, um, I mean, general information, education, pharmacy, and DME benefit. So when a prescriber wants to start a patient on CGM, they initiate the power form and fill out the date that it's requested, the uh, preferred language, and the type of CGM requested and whether or not the patient needs a receiver. And then the contact information and insurance information self-populates from the chart. When the prescriber signs this form, it triggers a message to the refill pool, letting them know that there's a new request for CGM that's been made. Next slide. So as we saw on the process maps, the process is not linear. So at the same time that the refill team is working on fulfilling the prescription, um, the education tab can be filled out by the education team, which is primarily the CDCESs, um, and they can document when the education was requested, when the class was scheduled, if the patient attended the class, and then if they didn't attend the class, any follow-up that was done with the family. Next slide. So the pharmacy benefit, benefit is for, uh, tab is completed by the pharmacist and the DME benefit tab is usually completed by our admin team. And they, these two tabs are similar. I'm showing here the DME tab because as you all know, this, this process is a bit more complicated. Um, but here there's a place to document what DME company the patient uses, 
what um, paperwork is sent to the DME company and when it's sent, um, when the DME supplies are shipped to the patient. Um, and then if the PA is not approved, if a appeal is required, when the appeal was made, um, and then when that was approved, and then if ultimately the CGM is not approved, we, there's also a place to document that the provider was notified so they can let the patient know and have the option to, to prescribe a different CGM device. Um, so these forms help track process because they're accessible to everyone on the multidisciplinary team. So if I see a patient in clinic for whom I recommended uh, CGM at their last visit and they're not wearing it, I don't have to look 20 places in the chart to find out where they got lost in the process. It's all in one place. Um, similarly, if a patient calls wanting to know where their supplies are, there's one place that anyone in the team can look to try to 